I'm going to be discussing um, human health and ecological risks from a group of chemicals called PFAS. Um, and it'll sort of be a case study that's mostly centered on Alaska, but I have pulled in some Australia specific um, topics as well. So we will um, sort of look at that relevance and compare a little bit later on in the talk. Um, but before I get started talking about PFAS specifically, um, it's really important to clarify what I mean when I say risk, um, because uh, you know the general concept of risk is often very poorly understood. Uh, we tend to think of risk being the same thing as something that's dangerous or hazardous, uh, which is in fact not really the case. Um, so risk has to, uh, it only really exists when we have an overlap of both something that is inherently dangerous, so something that is hazardous, and then we also um, have exposure that occurs as well. So, um, for example, people tend to think, oh, nuclear weapons are terrifying, um, nuclear power plants are really dangerous, um, things like that. But in fact, if you're not going to come in contact with either of those things, which we um, typically don't, then your risk is actually zero. So it doesn't matter really how dangerous something is if there's no exposure. And when we talk about um, exposure and hazard determining risk, it's also somewhat reciprocal. So you can have something that doesn't necessarily seem terribly hazardous, um, but then if you have a lot of exposure to it, it can actually end up being quite a big driver of risk. Um, so for example, we don't really tend to think of the flu as being you know, a, a particularly serious life event or a very serious illness. Um, but just in America, for example, um, we have about 710,000 people hospitalized annually um, with the flu and then as many as 52,000 deaths every year. So when we compare that to um, our previous example of something um, like a nuclear weapon being dropped, the flu is actually a much more risky um, example of an event than um, the nuclear example I gave previously. And another good comparison of this is um, bioterrorism or chemical warfare. So people tend to think of this as, um, you know, a very important thing to plan for and a very risky situation. And it is, of course, always important to be prepared uh, for something like this. But when we actually look at history, um, there's only very exceptionally rare instances of chemical warfare, bioterrorism that occur in a non-military setting. So, um, and we have no reported deaths in the US. So um, actually the risk is negligible when we talk about bioterrorism, whereas the flu is actually a very risky situation. Um, so I've talked a bit about um, that you know, reciprocity between hazard and exposure and um, how they drive risk. But when we assess risk for environmental contaminants, um, both to risk to humans and then also risk to ecological receptors, which is really kind of, um, when I say receptor, I mean any plant or animal or living thing that can be exposed in the environment um, to the contaminant. Uh, there's, there's several other different things that we look at when we are performing an assessment of risk to determine whether we need to take um, intervention, make some interventions or take precautionary measures or do some remediation at the site. Um, so the first thing is the levels of contamination present. And um, of course, we also wanna know, are we being exposed to multiple things at the same time? Um, so that can definitely affect the likelihood of a human experiencing some adverse health effects if you're being exposed to mercury and oil and PFAS and pharmaceuticals. Um, the other thing is the fate and partitioning of the contaminants in the environment. Um, so we know that, you know, there are a lot of inherently dangerous chemicals, but if they're buried underneath the sediment at a depth that none of the animals are going to come in contact with or no humans are expected to be exposed to, um, and then we consider that to be not bioavailable. And so again, the risk goes down. So it's important to know where those contaminants end up in the environment. Um, 
Another thing that is, of course, very important to consider is the severity of the outcomes. Um, so what is going to happen if we have animals or plants or humans exposed to these different contaminants? Um, and so that kind of determines the level of caution that's exercised when we do risk assessment. Uh, understandably, if um, we have something that is a known carcinogen, it causes cancer or it causes birth defects, um, then we're going to want to exercise a greater degree of caution than if it's a contaminant that we know, um, you know, we can take some pretty easy steps to protect people's health. Or if the, um, you know, the outcomes are reversible, then it's maybe not as important to sort of go through a, a large amount of prevention for contact um, and remediation, especially. So sort of along those same lines, uh, we want to look at the type of, um, I'm going to say receptors present, and then I'm going to use um, human receptors and examples. So if the contamination is located, um, you know, at an industrial site where no one's going to really be outside or there's not a lot of animals expected to be present, that's going to, of course, be a less um, important risk than if the contamination is on a playground at a school. Um, so we consider all of these different things when we perform risk assessments. Um, and so I've got over here um, HHRA, which stands for Human Health Risk Assessment, and then ERA, which is Ecological Risk Assessment. And that just refers to, um, you know, the type of receptors present. Are we worried about the plants and animals and the ecological impacts, um, or are we looking at human health impacts? Um, so you may see those abbreviations throughout, but uh, that's really what they're referring to. And so I went through a lot of different, um, you know, factors that are considered when we're performing a risk assessment, but ultimately it comes back to that um, same uh, thing that I sort of led with is the degree of exposure. So how much are you going to be exposed to, how frequently, and how hazardous is that chemical? And so now we'll go ahead and get into um, the contaminants of the hour, which are PFAS. And um, this is an umbrella term that stands for per and polyfluoral alkyl substances. And uh, so you can see, obviously, why we abbreviate it. It's a pretty intense mouthful. But um, we're going to look today at whether they pose a risk or not. Um, you may have heard a bit about them in the news uh, they can be referred to as uh, Teflon chemicals, or you'll sometimes hear them referred to as forever chemicals. And there's been a lot of question as to whether or not um, the effects are necessarily severe enough to, you know, warrant all the attention that the PFAS are getting. And so we're going to sort of walk through this to look at whether or not uh, the exposure and the hazard are um, high enough to pose a risk to human and ecological health. So I'm a really visual person. Uh, so I've got this flowchart here and I'll kind of revisit it a few times throughout the talk just to make sure that we're all on the same page and I haven't lost anyone with all of my vocabulary. And so I, um, I just, again, will return to this really simple thing that sort of this flowchart that examines that reciprocal relationship between exposure and hazard. And then we will use our decision-making points to determine whether or not uh, we consider this to be a risky type exposure. Um, a quick background on PFAS. So I mentioned previously it's an, um, an umbrella term and it stands for per and polyfluoral alkyl, alkyl substances. And this is a really huge class of compounds and they're all man-made. So it is about 5,000 different compounds that are uh, basically chains of carbons bonded to fluorines. And so these have been around and in mass production since the 40s or 50s and used for a whole range of applications. And this is because they have these amazing properties that make them really desirable to apply to things that we don't want to get wet or we don't want to get stained or uh, you can you make something heat resistant, put out fires. So you can imagine all of the different things that are just in your house that may be coated in PFAS. For example, I don't know how many of you um, have ever spilled something on your couch and been amazed that it didn't leave a giant stain, but there is a reason for that. You weren't just lucky. Um, it is in fact uh, because it's coated in PFAS. 
and um, it sort of makes it more stain resistant. Uh, another thing that uh, we, you, I'm just going to go over a few, um, I sort of kind of touched on these amazing properties that they have, but they are just in an amazing range of products. So in addition to you know anything that you have that's waterproof or anything that you have that's stain resistant, it's also going to be on anything that you don't want sticking. So when I talk about stickiness, I'm talking about your food, the packaging uh, that all your fast food comes in or that your granola bars and different wrappers um, for different types of foods. The reason that it's not sticking to that package is because uh, they actually do apply PFAS to the inside of the food wrappers to make it uh, not adhere to, to that um, wrapping on the outside. So as you can imagine, that poses quite a few um, exposure pathways for humans when we are coating our food packaging in PFAS. So I've talked a bit about, of course, the ways that we can be exposed to these things, where they located in our house. Uh, but another really important thing to talk about is the physicochemical properties of these compounds. Uh, and it really plays a huge role in why we're so concerned about them right now. So the first thing I want to mention is I previously said that they have these uh, carbon fluorine bonds and they're, you know, these chains of carbons. And that carbon fluorine component of these compounds is really, really critical because the carbon fluorine bond is one of the strongest found in nature. And so these compounds are called forever chemicals because they really do not uh, degrade through normal environmental processes. And uh, additionally, besides that, they also aren't really able to be metabolized by living organisms. So that is an incredibly important component. We find that they're unbelievably stable, if not indestructible in the environment in a lot of um, under normal conditions. Another important property here is if you look at the structure of this compound, you've got this, of course, carbon fluorine chain that we would expect to be hydrophobic or water fearing. And then um, we've got this other functional group here that is hydrophilic or water loving. And so what happens is that this means that they can both distribute throughout the water column because of this functional group over here, or they can accumulate in biota because of this uh, lipophilic or hydrophobic chain. And so when we find that these uh, compounds get into water, what really rapidly happens is that any hydrologically connected waters immediately become impacted. So they just spread out throughout the entire reservoir. And then they start to accumulate in any of the aquatic biota that are present in the water. And so we find that fish oftentimes have 2000 times higher concentrations than the water around them of many PFAS. And so uh, we call this something that accumulates in a living organism. Uh, it's called a bioaccumulative compound. And so these uh, you know, different compounds, the PFAS compounds will accumulate in biota and they can, um, as I said, be transported throughout the entire water column, which means they can actually uh, travel fairly long distances whenever we have a source of contamination. So another, uh, I just mentioned the traveling long distances in the environment. Uh, these compounds are globally distributed. So they have been unbelievably widely used. I mentioned previously that they're just, everything we use is coated in them, even your floss. And so because of the widespread use and because uh, they are so persistent and they're so resistant to degradation and can be transported throughout water, what has happened is that we have a global contamination issue. So all of these things combined together have led to a scenario where we're finding them in every single country, we're finding them in every single human, and we're finding them in all animals and plants, even in really remote environments uh, in the Arctic and in Antarctica. So in fact, in the US, there was a survey that included over 2000 different people um, during the 1999 to 2000 time period, and they found PFOS and PFOA, which are two of the most, I guess, infamous types of PFAS, which is our umbrella term. Um, so PFOS and PFOA were present in the blood serum of nearly every single person that was um, surveyed. And the important thing to point out here is at the time, our detection levels were really terrible. So the fact that we were finding them in nearly every person indicates that um, they're 
present at fairly high levels because we were not very good at detecting them either. We've gotten much better. So we know that there's widespread exposure. And if we go back to that flow chart, um, exposure is really one of those things that determines whether or not you're at risk. So we know we have exposure here. And so now we just need to figure out, is there a hazard? And there's been a lot of debate about that. So we're gonna talk about that for just a minute and the different um, conclusions and data that are available to us to make these decisions about risk. So are they hazardous is the million dollar question. I mentioned before they're bioaccumulative. So they will um, of course be present at much higher concentrations in biota and the environment relative to if you know they're aquatic organisms relative to the water. And they have a really long residence time in organisms and we also can't metabolize them. And in the world of toxicology, all of those things are just huge red flags. And so we of course know that these are really bad signs, but we don't really know what exactly might be the outcome of these exposures. Um, and when I say that, we know what will happen if we're exposed to PFAS at really high levels. Uh, there are a few communities that have been really contaminated um, near production facilities, uh, things like that. And so we've been able to do some epidemiological studies to look at what the um, results of high levels of exposure are. But what we don't really know to this day is how this low level exposure that every single one of us is experiencing day in and day out, uh, how is that ultimately impacting our health over time? Um, and that's a very complicated matter to get at when we're talking about exposures for humans, because of course, we are exposed as long lived organisms who have various lifestyles. We're exposed to a range of things over our lifetime. And it's hard to pinpoint exactly, um, you know, which compound might have set you off in a certain trajectory of adverse health. What we do know from um, the studies that are available, both from those uh, highly exposed communities that I mentioned before, and also from animal studies is that it seems that PFAS is toxic to nearly every system in the body. So we know that um, now actually PFOA has been classified as a carcinogen by, the, um, by certain regulatory agencies in the US. And so we know that it leads to um, testicular cancer, it changes uh, fertility outcomes. And also there have been studies that show that reproductive organ size, and then also the procession through um, adolescence is impacted by exposure to PFAS during development. We see that there are a lot of immune system effects and that includes reduced responses to vaccinations. And something that's important to point out here though, um, for you know, full disclosure is that even though we see that people don't have that same immune response you would expect when you get a vaccination, there's not an overwhelming amount of evidence to show that it's leading to really high rates of infection. Um, so that is something to keep in mind. Um, when it comes to the GI system, we see people develop ulcerative colitis. There are a lot of different liver outcomes, including liver damage, kidney cancer, and um, a lot of different developmental and pregnancy outcomes that are also, of course, very serious. So what about the environment? I've talked a lot about what may happen to people who are exposed and not so much about what may happen to animals, but our, um, our studies so far show that animals, just like humans, experience a lot of different growth and reproductive and developmental effects from exposure. And sometimes because um, when we think about an aquatic organism just sort of sitting in a soup of PFAS and just continuing to be exposed throughout, uh, you know, day in, day out for its entire lifetime. Um, we find that oftentimes it's pretty low exposure concentrations in the environment ultimately become um, pretty toxic to aquatic organisms. So um, we find that the, the effects that can occur with this contamination are because they do occur on growth and reproduction there is a high potential for there to be population and community level changes over time if that persists, which because of their persistence, we would expect it to persist. So back to our flow charts, we know that there's exposure globally, 
we know that there is at least an indication that at, at some level of exposure, it's definitely going to be a, a hazardous outcome. And so when we put those two things together, as we covered in the beginning, uh, we see that there is a potential for risk. Uh, of course, that varies. So the degree of exposure is going to be determined by where you live, um, what sort of, you know, I guess, choices you make in your daily life and uh, various other things as well. And so in the U.S., of course, I'm sure you guys are less familiar with the, <laughs> the 50 states than I am. But I think um, most people are familiar with Alaska, which is really a very remote and considered a relatively pristine environment. Um, a lot of Alaska is above the Arctic Circle. And so uh, there's also a very limited road system in Alaska. And so we find that it is a really great place to study um, contaminants that are transported long ranges, uh, such as PFAS. So um, this is a pressing issue in a lot of different places, and I'm going to focus on Alaska here um, just to demonstrate that even in these remote, relatively pristine environments, it continues to be an issue. So these, with the limited resources that Alaska has, so the whole state um, is about 20% of the landmass of the United States. It's massive. It's larger than the next three largest states combined. And it has only about 750,000 people in the entire state. Um, and so the state has really limited resources to respond to these types of things. Um, and again, there's not a road system, so you have to take uh, small planes and fly into these places. But even with all of those challenges, these all are sites where we have confirmed that there is exposure to humans that are at levels of concern to human health. And so that's a fairly long list um, for a, a, you know, a state that has so few people and has really only two cities that are above 25,000 people. So where is it coming from? Because that is a lot of exposure. Um, and that's a lot of contamination for a place that doesn't really have a road system. So I mentioned that, you know, you can find PFAS on the insides of your food wrappers. A lot of the consumer products we use, like shampoo and floss and body wash, runs down our drains into the public water system. Um, and so anywhere that we see that there's wastewater discharge, there's also going to be PFAS contamination. Um, throwing away your wrappers and shampoo bottles, of course, in the landfill can uh, cause contamination at landfill, which can leach into the water column as well. Um, another thing that people don't often think about is actually biosolids. So we'll use, um, you know, the solid materials from wastewater treatment plants oftentimes as fertilizer for crops. And it just so happens that those biosolids contain extremely high levels of PFAS that were originally in the wastewater. And so that can be taken up by the crops that are growing and cause um, dietary exposure for humans eating them. But ultimately, this is where it comes from. This is a picture of a firefighter spraying something we call AFFF on a, a hydrocarbon fire. So AFFF stands for aqueous film forming foam. And these foams are um, absolutely essential when you have a hydrocarbon fire. So anywhere you have a petroleum or especially an airport, um, you have jet fuel, those types of things, you need to use um, a PFAS containing foam. Uh, at currently, you need to use a PFAS containing foam um, per FAA regulations to extinguish the fire to try and um, of course save lives if there is any kind of disaster involving a plane. So releases of AFFF in Alaska, I mentioned there's not really much of a road system. This is all of it. Um, so there are actually three highways in the entire state. And then you see this blue line down here is the ferry system, which counts as a, a road system in Alaska. So most of the transportation is coming from of course, aviation. And as I mentioned just now, where there are airplanes or where you have any kind of fuel that can be used to fly, um, you know, an airplane or helicopter, you need to have AFFF present. Um, and that is a federal regulation. So there are a lot of places where, um, you know, you have airports or you have military installations or airfields, and they're all using this aqueous film forming foam, this AFFF that contains PFAS. 
They're also required to train periodically. So um, a lot of times they're discharging large amounts of this foam just for practice purposes. It's not even being used to extinguish fire. So that is largely where all of the contamination globally comes from, is from um, discharge of these firefighting foams, which are used in every country around the globe and are starting to be phased out. Um, again, that can, that AFFF is really important when you have things like pipelines or you have a, um, any kind of a well where you're extracting petroleum um, or you have fuel storage and, of course, also at military sites and airfields. And both of these things, as you guys already know, are also really pertinent to uh, many different places in Australia as well. So when we look at exposure routes, we have found, going back to that map where we saw that there's so many contaminated sites around the state, um, we found it in drinking water. So that leads to a lot of the exposure that we know about in Alaska, but it's not just through drinking water. It's also through fish. Um, we've had PFAS, the AFFF will run off into surface waters and accumulate in the fish. Um, it accumulates in wild game that drink the water. And it also is accumulating in, uh, when they're irrigating with contaminated water, it's leading to contamination in produce as well. Or it could just be that the, the firefighting foam was discharged onto soil and the plants have taken it up directly. And so there's each one of these different exposure routes, we have um, clear instances of that occurring in these really pristine and isolated communities, which is fairly shocking. And this is very important, uh, particularly in Alaska, because as I mentioned, we don't have a road system. So people subsist off of the land. Um, most of the people in rural Alaska depend almost entirely on fish or marine mammals or wild game that they harvest during the year. And so um, when you have exposure through those different dietary routes, as well as in someone's drinking water, it can really lead to quite a bit of exposure for these people that are living really in very remote environments. It's kind of shocking. So we know that there's exposure happening, it's confirmed, it's happening through several different routes, um, but the presence of it alone doesn't necessarily tell us that there's going to be a risk to human health. Again, we have to go back and we have to say, okay, well, what is the hazard that it potentially poses? How dangerous is it? So when we go back and look at some of those um, various exposure pathways, probably one of the more disturbing um, cases of contamination was an organic farm near Fairbanks, Alaska. Fairbanks has a really large military base and a huge fire training center as well. And so a lot of AFFF has run off into various um, surface waters and um, it's also accumulated in soil and it's uh, entered the groundwater as well. So an organic farm near Fairbanks that was growing vegetables for the school district, in fact, was contaminated with PFAS in the, in the groundwater and they were irrigating with the groundwater and where, uh, you know, the contamination was discovered and was obviously a huge concern. So when we take the current um, toxicity values or the effect concentrations that the EPA is telling us we could expect some level of potential concern at for human health, and we compare those values to each person's exposure, we find that there is some risk um, through ingesting water and consuming contaminated vegetables from this farm um, that had AFFF runoff that entered the water table. And so looking at another different exposure route that is really pertinent to people living in these remote communities, um, a moose, or there were a lot of moose actually that were drinking from some contaminated surface water sources near an airfield um, in a really remote area of Alaska that was actually near um, a, a national park, a very huge national park that's not connected to the road system. So uh, the people here rely heavily on moose, particularly moose liver. And so um, when you go back and you look at the concentrations that we measured in moose muscle and in moose liver, and then you look at um, the potential, those uh, effect concentrations that we have available to us currently that tell us, you know, levels of concern. We find that in each instance, there is a potential for every age group, except for children ages two to five, um, 
who aren't expected to necessarily be consuming much moose liver, uh, we find that there is a potential human health concern through con subsistence consumption of moose. We also sampled bear muscle um, and bear liver and found that although uh, you know there were detectable levels of, of PFAS in this bear muscle and in the bear liver, they weren't present at a level of concern necessarily because people don't eat a lot of bear muscle, fortunately. So it's there, but it is not um, considered a major exposure route for these people. Fish, however, is overwhelmingly the most important issue when we talk about subsistence in Alaska. So this uh, fish composes most of many people's protein source in uh, throughout the entire state. Even people who do live on the road system do subsistence fish. It's a very big part of the culture. And so uh, when we look at the some of the concentrations we've measured in various surface water bodies in, um, in Alaska, the town actually that this data comes from is called North Pole. So it's North Pole, Alaska is a real town and it is not in the farthest north reaches as you might think and Santa Claus does not live there. But um, we do see that their fish uh, have fairly concerning levels of a few different types of PFAS in them um, that actually led to a lot of fish consumption advisories and several lakes had to be closed to subsistence fishing for residents nearby. And so taking all of this sort of in context and putting it together, and then thinking back about our two components of risk, exposure and hazard, um, it's safe to say that the, there is exposure for sure, and there is potential hazard um, when we talk about uh, the human health and ecological outcomes that it can occur when you have continuous PFAS exposure. And so we can conclude that even in this really remote, pristine environment that's not on a road system, there is risk of PFAS. So um, what about Australians? So it was really interesting sort of digging in this data and getting the opportunity to look at a new um, sort of landscape and some new you know, sites and exposure routes. And I was able to actually find a really interesting uh, figure that shows the different sites where we're um, there is an investigation that's ongoing with PFAS contamination in Australia. And so there are over 90 sites um, where there is suspected or confirmed PFAS contamination currently. Um, that are present on this map. And so um, I did get this. Uh, this is a combined figure that has um, the various environmental protection agency data combined with different county fire authorities and the Department of Defense as well and some other different um, sources. So that was really interesting to me. Um, and so Looking a bit more, um, so zooming in to sort of look at a specific case study here, um, EPA Victoria actually conducted a pilot environmental assessment, and the goal of this was to try and determine um, both how much PFAS contamination there was and how and where it was, and then also how many how much PFAS containing materials were sort of sitting around in these stockpiles um, in the form of AFFF. And so uh, when they conducted this uh, pilot environmental assessment, they found, and this is of course back in 2016, but they found when they sampled soil, groundwater, surface water, uh, marine animals, wastewater and landfills, there was PFAS present in every single sample type. Uh, they also inventoried over 14,000 kilograms of AFFF that contains PFAS. And um, they, of course, concluded that fire trading grounds and petroleum facilities, things like that, airports and chemical manufacturers were the main sources of contamination in Victoria. There's a similar um, type of study that was conducted in Queensland. And so this was actually a little bit different. Uh, the approach they used was they um, identified facilities that would have a high likelihood of using AFFF, which we know is the most common source of PFAS in the environment. And they actually sent out a voluntary survey to the site managers. And so they sort of directed it towards these very targeted um, facilities. 
and they asked questions that covered a range of topics, which included how much PFAS do you have stockpiled? How many times have you discharged it? Which, you know, in which ways were you using it? Were you training or was there some kind of emergency? And um, how are you doing on your containment and waste management practices? And are you complying with current policy? And when they got their results back, um, actually there was a fairly large amount of site managers responded. They found that less than 5% of sites were actually complying with the, the waste containment and management practices that they were supposed to be adhering to. And that um, there was over 425,000 kilograms of AFFF in Queensland that uh, was just present at the facilities that actually responded to the survey. So I think it's safe to say based on the data that we've just sort of glazed over so far, there's definitely exposure. And we covered earlier um, the hazards of potential PFAS exposure at, at some concentration. And um, because we have both exposure and hazard present, uh, we can expect that there is a potential for risk as well. So what is happening? Um, so there, Australia has developed a national environmental management plan um, that's fairly comprehensive, and it's been implemented by a lot of the different um, states and territories, and it has uh, also been implemented federally and is endorsed by the environmental ministers. And so it does what many management plans do. It talks about how to monitor and assess sites, uh, how you're supposed to sample, and it also talks uh, a bit about um, communicating and engaging communities that are impacted by PFAS contamination, because of course we know that there are other effects on these communities aside from the potential adverse health outcomes we discussed previously. It comes with a lot of emotional um, distress when you feel that your children are of course drinking contaminated water and there's nothing that you can do about it. Um, so there is a, a bit of guidance as well um, on how to try and communicate these results to communities. And then what everyone wants to know, um, how much can I be exposed to, according to Australia? <laughs> um, what is the safe amount that um, I can consume and not expect to have an adverse health outcome? So um, I first got these ecological receptor values here because I was super impressed that they had been developed. And um, I'm gonna sh point out here quickly that in order pr to protect 99% of species, of this single P, uh, PFAS type, which is called PFOS, you're supposed to have 0.23 parts per trillion or less to protect um, aquatic receptors. So something that's swimming around in PFOS contaminated water. And a part per trillion is akin to a single drop in a, an Olympic sized swimming pool. And so this is less than a full part per trillion is expected to um, be needed to protect most species in the water. And so when I move on to um, the human health values, it's interesting to see that uh, PFOS, as a human, we can be exposed to drinking water that has 70 parts per trillion. So a nanogram per liter is also a part per trillion. So um, they have decided that 70 parts per trillion of PFOS and PFH excess together is um, considered to not be of concern for humans, which is really quite interesting when you look at the values that are potentially concerning for aquatic receptors. Um, and then looking over at these values for PFOA, uh, which is a known carcinogen. It has officially been um, labeled a carcinogen and it is um, at 560 parts per trillion in drinking water. So these are um, pretty far off from what a lot of other countries are actually implementing. Um, which is interesting because this, this plan was updated in 2020. And so I'm, of course, going to give you some, I guess, values for comparison here. Um, these values that you see are nanograms per kilogram of body weight per day. And we use that, that unit so that we can um, determine what different risks might be for a child versus an adult or somebody that's, you know, not quite a mature person, um, of course, you don't want to use the same body weight for all of those people. And so when we translate these values into drinking water concentrations, that 20 um, nanograms per kilogram of body weight per day of PFOS and PHXS comes out to 70 parts per trillion. So in the US, it's 70 parts per trillion as well for PFOS plus PFOA. 
And if you go back and you look at these values here, you'll see that PFOA by itself is 560 nanograms per liter of parts per trillion. Um, and these values are um, in light of the new data showing carcinogenic um, properties. They are expected to drop drastically when the EPA reevaluates um, the values for PFOA. And so um, we have another agency called the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry. And if you look at their values, they're much, much lower. And in fact, it, it, it um, comes out to, for a sum of four different compounds, uh, 20 PPT. And then looking at the new values adopted by the EU, we see that they are allowing for all PFAS present in the water less than one part per trillion, um, or I'm sorry, less than 0.62 nanograms per kilogram of body weight per day, which is about 2.2 parts per trillion for every single PFAS added together. And then poor Canada is behind the game <laughs> with these values that you see here. Um, and they don't have anything for PFH excess, which Australia does have that. So um, what globally what's happening? Um, well, PFOS and PFOA, those two culprits I mentioned in the beginning, um, they were phased out in the 2000s, but of course they're still hanging around just because they're so persistent. They were so widely used. And um, we've now transitioned to shorter chain compounds that are expected to not be so bioaccumulative and that we can excrete faster. Um, and so because they are less bioaccumulative, they don't stick around for quite as long and we can excrete them faster, they're thought to have a, a lower degree of risk because we have a lower exposure. Um, however, uh, the National Toxicology Program recently um, released multiple years worth of data that they've been collecting over um, you know, long-term with different a range of species, including rodent studies, and they found that at equal concentrations, many of these short chain compounds that we're switching to are actually equally or more toxic than the original PFOS and PFOA compounds that are still floating around in the environment. And so um, it's important to remember that exposure to these new compounds um, is more uncertain because we don't know what the outcomes are. They oftentimes cause the same types of health effects. And they're in addition to all of the exposure that we're currently experiencing because of the legacy contamination as well. And so um, I, it's safe to say that there is some degree of risk globally for um, people exposed to PFAS and that does include Australians, unfortunately, um, we're all in this together. So um, hopefully we can also sort of resolve some of these issues together and uh, reduce the risk for both ecological and human receptors.